All right, hello everybody. Um, we're here. Uh, uh, my name is Jim Glade, and I'm the director of media outreach at Publicize. And this is George Chilton, and he's the editor in chief of our editorial team. Hi guys, nice to nice to see you all here. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for um, for taking the time. Uh, I want to say that we're using a couple of um, uh, personal microphones, um, so if anybody cannot hear right now. Um, please go ahead and let us know, but I think we should be uh, broadcasting nice and sound, uh, nice and clear. Yeah. Also, let's say hello to the people who are watching on Facebook. Uh, we've got we've got uh, two webinars going on at once. So I think it's possible. All the quality is good and hear us. So let us know if you can. All right. All right. From so basically um, today, George and I are gonna um, take a quick. Um, minute um, to talk about kind of some mistakes. Um, we've been working at Publicize for a couple of years um, uh, at different capacities and we've seen a lot of different mistakes um, admittedly uh, made by us and also um, we've seen um, some mistakes uh, that founders often make and so we wanted to take this time to kind of um, uh, reflect on those mistakes and maybe share some learnings. Um, I think maybe the first mistake we made today, though, man, is the wearing the same color shirt on a webinar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. That was my fault. Yeah. I apologize. So actually, we, we really, obviously, we're going to look at the mistakes that we've made or, or customers have made in, in campaigns. But the, the purpose really is to focus on the positive, what, what you guys can apply to your own um, your own, own campaigns, the learnings you can take so you can have a really successful um, PI or public relations experience. So uh, you ready to kick off? Yeah, sure. Uh, and and actually, first, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, please go ahead and feel free to um, send them over in the chat screen, um, and we'll answer them right away. Yeah. Or, or maybe maybe at the end, depending on. Sure. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I think the first um, lesson we've we've learned really is is when when somebody starts a PR campaign, um, but they don't have their product or service or whatever it happens to be, their website 100% ready. Um, it's very, very important that, um, that that you make sure that your product service is, is ready before you reach out to the media. Um, so we, we can take an app as an example, right, Jim? Yeah, this is kind of an amalgamation of a, a, a few campaigns. Um, you know, we, we're, we're rushing to get our messaging out. Um, we're finding our, our journalists and we're contacting them. Um, with the expectation that, let's say, the App Store is going to be approving our app um, on a certain date at a certain time. Um, and then, you know, you get, um, you line up a journalist that's interested in covering your story, and it really um, leaves a sour taste in their mouth when you have to go and say, hey, you know what, um, Apple didn't approve uh, for one reason or another. Um, so, um, you know, you want to it would be my recommendation that um, you have everything 100% approved um, before you reach out to a journalist. I don't know if you have anything to add, George. No, just, just it, it, it's, a, it's one of those things where the journalist is excited about your product. You've basically got one chance to get them to cover you in this usually. And uh, if, if you say, hey, test out my app, they're really excited about it. And then you come and say, actually, no, it's, it's not ready. Uh, it'll be ready in three months. They're going to lose interest, and, and it's unlikely that they'll want to cover you. Again. So that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you have it, it already and set up and you're confident that it, it's it's working well. Which brings us on to the second point related to uh, having your product ready, which is making sure that you've tested your product. If you don't test your, your product beforehand, you haven't ironed out the kinks, and then you hand it to somebody who's effectively going to pull it to pieces to see whether it works and, and to really, really test it, they, they could completely slate your product, completely say, this is this is terrible, give you give you points. So really you want to make sure you've tested it with your your customers and clients, you've had a maybe a beta trial and, and, and that sort of thing beforehand. We have an example of um, an app, an anonymous anonymous app, right? Jim? Yeah, it was a it was a an anonymous app um, that claimed to be you know hundred percent anonymous. Um, and uh, you know at the time we we, we sent it over and um, it turns out that um, in order to sign up, you did need an email address. And so there was some sort of connection that um, somebody could find if they, if they looked hard enough um, to the person. And 
this was around the time of the Ashley Madison um, hack as well. So um, these anonymous apps were actually very... Um, they're under scrutiny, right? Yeah, they're under scrutiny as it is, right? So um, it actually turned out to be quite positive because um, um, the, the writer wrote an article um, that gave some really good constructive feedback um, to, to a founder um, and he could take that feedback and improve on his product. Um, but you want to make sure that really your product does what you say it does. Yeah. Um, so those are some good um, points to think about before you reach out to a journalist. Absolutely. And just to add to what you were saying there, when he got uh, the founder got good feedback or, or constructive criticism, shall we say, on their, their app, um, it's very important that they, they went and, and said thanks to that journalist and mm -hmm. thank you for your, your constructive criticism. And then you can actually, if, if something like that does happen, hopefully it, it won't ever happen to you, but you can take it and use it to your advantage because then you can uh, go back to that journalist with an improved version of your product and say, hey, you, you covered this six months ago and that we've got a new version of it. Um, would you like to see how, how we've taken your feedback on board? It makes it, it, it puts the position, uh, the, the journalist in a position of importance and it shows that you really do care about what their opinions were and they're likely to potentially give you another review and maybe revise their, their initial uh, negative opinion. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing that I think we're going to look at under this point, not having your product ready, is thinking about timing and where you've positioned your, your product in in relation to the, the your competition. So for example, if you have, C, you have a CRM tool or a product management tool, you have to be aware that there are gonna be lots of others like it. Unless you are unique and uh, a unique butterfly in the universe, you've gotta make sure that you are um, differentiating yourself from the competition, right? Mm -hmm. um, show how yours is better, yours is more targeted to a specific audience or maybe, um, yeah, show, show how it's going to impact the market, otherwise you're going to be ignored. It's not, not that people think you're bad, but they think you they might think you're boring if you don't show why you're, you know, yeah. better, right? And, and, so. and yeah, and that will kind of lead us into the next, um, uh, the next point yeah. is well, a lot of people make mistakes on, on messaging. Um, so, um, for example, if, you, if you're going to create a press release or a uh, pitch email to a journalist, um, you want to make sure you include the necessary information um, that proves to them that, hey, this is actually a story that is important to their readership. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, a lot of mistakes a founder might make is, is when they reach out to, the, uh, to a journalist, they'll, they'll kind of just say what they're doing at this moment. You know, hey, we're two guys in a garage and we're coding. Um, and really, we want to make sure that we kind of amplify um, the... Uh, the message of where you guys are going to be. So um, you want to you want to use context um, to show how big your market is. For example, like when when we're five years down the road and we have three hundred uh, clients and or I'm sorry, three hundred employees and we're taking over the world. This is what we're going to be affecting. And you want to show you know market size, um, even the size of the problem that you're going to be solving and the impact that you have. And then also points of of differentiation you know how are you different and better from the current people that are already in your space yeah absolutely just to add I mean just to reiterate really you are you're you're communicating your dream your vision your mission to the journalist because that's what makes you exciting at the end of the day if you are two guys working in the garage um, think like Steve Jobs and Wozniak these guys were just two coders in the garage, but they had a huge dream and they took it as far as they could. And that's what you want to do. You want to show the journalists where you're going, uh, not just where you are, because that's that will that is the hook that will grab. There's a, a, a personal example um, from us. We um, uh, before starting Publicize, um, we worked at a co-working space called uh, Espacio in Medellin, Colombia, and um, we were trying to get um, coverage for Espacio. Um, and basically, as far as stories go, kind of a co-working space is probably as boring as it gets. It's nothing more than office chairs and renting out um, some space for a little bit higher than you pay for it in rent, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, we didn't see our mission as just building or just creating a co-working space where we charge rent. We kind of saw our mission um, as, as creating um, or helping to create uh, Medellin, 
the city that the um, Espacio is located in, um, to helping fuel that to become a um, a startup hub in Latin America. Absolutely. So, so that's the mission that we portrayed to um, to the media, and we ended up getting on um, TechCrunch and the BBC and, and some others as well. So, um, you want to make sure that you're not undercutting what it is that your mission is. Absolutely, and and bringing bringing um, context, industry context into into your mission is very important as well. So you can't say that I'm gonna be the, my app, whatever it happens to be, is gonna be the biggest in the world, unless you explain and outline what the market is. Um, so it's really, really important to include those facts. Um, so I think it's really important that you're not just saying, hey, we're gonna be world leaders in this field. You can't walk around with your head in the clouds, you've got to have your feet firmly planted on the ground. Uh, so use use facts and figures and, and, and markets and, and stuff to, to back up what you're saying and what you're yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, like, for example, we didn't just say, hey, um, you know, uh, Medellin has huge potential. We linked actually to like, uh, uh, there was a government um, report um, about uh, the government investing a certain amount of money into the startup sector. Um, and so that was that evidence coupled with what we were trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Basing your mission on a, on, a, on a trend or a, a market is key, really. The second thing, or the, the next thing in this this particular point um, of, of making sure you've got right, a good content strategy is looking at your social proof. And your social proof really comes down to reputation. It's it's who you are, um, it's, it's your professional and also your personal background. You could be, for example, um, uh, an ex-Google uh, engineer or an IBM executive or whatever it is, and you've decided to come along and create your own startup, which is fantastic uh, professional um, uh, evidence, uh, which which like backs you up and, and gives you that sort of uh, credential. It's credential, but it's not just about your your professional life. It, it comes down to things that make you interesting personally as well. What what do you like to highlight about yourself? So we could we could talk about a mistake that we made in one of our campaigns where we had a, an ex-professional uh, sports player, and we weren't aware of this until mid-campaign or until the campaign was very nearly over, and that would have been something that we would have used in the pitching process. Yeah, make. because it's not every day that um, an ex-professional sports player starts a tech company. Um, so something like that leaves you um, ma ma makes you stand out. Um, I think a good point about social proof, because um, a lot of people sometimes like I, I could be more modest or something, and, and you know uh, that's completely understandable. But it's good to know, like you're not going to have always a personal relationship with the journalist, um, but there are things that you can provide to them that will help them infer more about you, um, which is really important. So when you do tell them that I'm an ex Google engineer or I went to MIT or, um, you know, they can infer from that that you're, you're a hard worker, you're a serious person. Um, or in the opposite, like if you did get kicked out yeah, of I, MIT. I got kicked out of MIT. I didn't. I, didn't. I, mean, I got <laughs> kicked out of MIT. Uh, that's great. I mean, like a founder who was kicked out of MIT launches startup and <clears throat> raises 50 million in funding, whatever it happens to be, is a, is a great lead for a journalist, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, Think about it um, before you reach out. What are what are the things that you um, think might be interesting, um, or you know some things that you don't assume are interesting, but they could be. So lay them all out there. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, okay, what else could we say? I think that we can come on to the next point, which is talking about respecting journalistic etiquette and ethics and, and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, so I'll let you you take the, the lead on this because this is where you contact the journalists more than I do. But uh, I think the first thing we can talk about is looking at exclusives and offering exclusives for sure to, to journalists. Sure, I'll, I'll explain that. Um, basically, an exclusive um, is saying to a journalist that they're the only one on the planet that has this information and they reserve first right to publish. Um, and this is attractive to a journalist because at the end of the day, the job is to break news. Um, and so uh, when, when they know that they'll, they'll be the first person um, to be able to break this news, it's often more attractive. So uh, at Publicize, we often use an exclusive um, for some of uh, the stronger stories. Um, so it's, it's a very big um, mistake um, when uh, you offer 
and exclusive to multiple journalists or multiple publications. Um, and then you have to come back to one of them and tell them, I'm sorry, um, somebody else has, uh, has already agreed to the exclusive. And uh, I know you work on a timeline when you're reaching out. You know, you, you have this announcement that you want to make about your company and you know you want to make it within the next four weeks or so. So um, what you're going to be able to do is be very upfront with the journalist and you can even put in the email pitch um, saying like, you have um, until, you know, you have 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever it may be, to decide on whether you'd like an exclusive and then at that time we'll move on to another publication. Um, and I think that's, you know, like a really fair way of, of being able to give them kind of an exploding deadline to see if they're really interested in this story. Yeah, so don't be afraid to do that. I know it sounds a bit um, harsh to say respond within 48 hours or you, you won't get, get the story, but journalists themselves work to very tight deadlines four or five, depending on the publication, up to five stories a day. So you've, you've really, they, they'll understand if you give them that deadline. And then you can move on without being worried about sure. having multiple exclusives. And also saying that as well, don't try and trick journalists. I'm, I'm sure none of you would do that, but don't try and offer multiple exclusives and not tell one or the other that the other person's covering it because they will find out. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll either take down the story or they just won't, they won't work with you again. So that's very, very important. Yeah, and, and, and that's something that, we've done. Point out. Um, but yeah, no. It's not a mistake we made, but it is a mistake that could be made. So. Um, also, a, a, a good point is to respect journalist time. Um, I, I think that that kind of uh, uh, is, is said in, in or is, is shown in, in saying that, hey, you have 48 hours to kind of decide, and then from there you can, we can work around your schedule um, if you wanted to publish a, a piece. But um, you have to understand that um, you're not owed any coverage. Um, uh, really, a journalist, um, it's, it's quite a big, um, a big favor, I, I would say, when a journalist does cover your company. And so you want to be completely respectful of their time. Um, if, you, you know, if you do um, get a journalist that's interested, work as much as you can around their schedule to hop on a call. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I would bend over backwards for that. Um, and then also, um, I would say, don't miss those calls. Um, you know, if you've, if you've scheduled a call with somebody, make sure you're there um, and, and have all the information ready for them. Um, like George said earlier, um, like it could be that they're publishing five, six articles a day um, and they're on a tight deadline from the editor. And so you want to make sure that you make it as easy as possible for them to write a story about you. Yeah, the good, the good uh, rule of thumb, I think, to use is treat a journalist as you would treat a, a potential investor or partner, because at the end of the day, they're going to be bringing a lot of value uh, to your company by, by putting you in their publication. And also think that, that they're, as we say, they're writing five to six articles a day, but their, their inboxes, if you've ever seen a journalist's inbox, it would give you nightmares. They get hundreds of emails a day, um, pitches, press releases, uh, requests, and, and, and all sorts of things from editors. And they have to the way through these. So when, you're, when your release, your, your news really stands out to them, uh, you should be really excited, like, fantastic, I'm going to get this coverage. And even if they, they call you out of the blue, try and make that time for them. Be, if you can't, you can't, but really do your best to, to do that because it's, it's so important. It's such a big opportunity. For sure. Your, your team. Um, while we're talking about um, um, journalist etiquette and outreach here, Ma Mauricio, you have a good question. Um, you asked, should you send a story along with the exclusive request? Um, so if, if you're talking about a press release, um, I would say 100% yes. Um, basically, like, like we have talked about, um, a journalist's time is, is very valuable. So um, the, the goal of the uh, pitch email is actually more to entice um, the journalist. It should be very short in length, um, you know, a couple of paragraphs, and it should get right to the point with what the story is, what the most important information is, and anything you can provide in terms of um, stats or data on context to make them understand, you know, how big and important of a story this is and why they should cover it now. Um, and then you can also attach or just go ahead and copy um, right into the email chain below um, the actual press release. And the, the point of the press release isn't to entice a journalist, it's to provide them with as much information as possible um, 
took for them to write the story. So again, you'd be respectful of their time because all at once you'd be saying, hi, like here's the, here's the most important part of the story in the email pitch. And then I have all this other information like that includes quotes, um, that includes context, et cetera, that will be really good um, for them to be able to hop right in if they're interested in the story and then they can you know, talk to you via email if they have any questions or hop on the phone. Yeah, just to add to that, what you're saying is, is absolutely true. When you when a journalist receives a press release, the last thing they really want is a, is a, a piece of writing full of marketing language and slang and buzzwords. What they really want is the news and the story told to them in the, the cleanest and most easy, easily understandable way. So one mistake that we often see um, or, or one misconception is that it should be full of jargon, that you should be trying to impress. You don't want to say that you have the most innovative, disruptive platform in the world. Uh, you want to be saying what your platform does um, with the most important information at the top of the press release, imagining a sort of a, an inverted pyramid sort of shape with the, the top key details, what the announcement is. You've, you've got funding, you've got a new product or a launch or an app, whatever it is. Followed as you go down the pyramid, you, you add details and you make it more and more interesting. Uh, the context, the stats, what the, the features of the platform are, what the price is, and that sort of thing. Um, so it really, you start with the main details and you, you, you drill down into the, into the intricacy of the specifics of your, of your product and service. Cool. Cool. Uh, we got another question from Carlos, um, and it's uh, along the same lines um, when talking about journalist etiquette. Um, so, uh, Carlos, first of all, uh, good question. Uh, what is the best alternative to manage unresponsive magazine editors? Um, and, and this is huge, and I, I'm going to answer it in two ways. Um, first of all, um, I, would, I would recommend sending uh, your first email pitch and then waiting at least 24 hours. And then if you haven't heard from them, you can send a follow-up. Um, after you've sent that second follow-up, if you still haven't heard from them, um, you, it's safe to assume that they are not interested in this, uh, in this story. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're reaching out to an editor, by the way, Carlos, and you're, and you're pitching a, um, uh, a story that is uh, like for a writer to cover your company, um, if you're reaching out to an editor, you might have less luck um, and you might want to be reaching out to a reporter, um, depending on the size of the publication. Um, you know, at a big publication like the New York Times or Wired, um, the editors actually, um, you know, edit the articles that the journalists turn in. So um, they're not, they don't have as much time to, uh, to take a look at the stories that you're pitching. You want to pitch to a journalist um, that's actually writing about um, the beat that your company would fall into. Yeah. Um, so, that's that's one thing that you want to think of when you're when you're actually reaching out to journalists. Um, so so like I said to kind of recap on that, if if you've reached out to them once, you don't hear a response, feel free to follow up again. If you don't hear a response after that, you can assume that they're not interested, and you can move on to the to the next publication. That said, if you've already been in contact with somebody, um, and you've kind of got the wheels going on a, on a possible article. Um, I would recommend, um, you know, following up, uh, but don't be like a crazy ex-boyfriend. Um, I, I would say more uh, along the lines of following up every um, 48 hours um, with an email up to a certain point. I would say, you know, if you're sending two follow-up emails that haven't been answered or three follow-up emails that haven't been answered at all, um, it, you know, it might be time um, for you to um, to lay off and not bother it. And the reason being is is because you might just be setting yourself up for failure for your next announcement. Absolutely. You know, it could be that... Um, um, you don't want to burn that bridge, right? Yeah. If you're too pushy... Don't uh, remember that. Exactly. I know that oh, this guy again, this, this, this person again. So um, I think that brings us on. We didn't talk about the beats and the journalists and actually targeting those, the right people as well. Sure. So we've talked about how you pitch and, and, and the information you need in the, in, the, in the press release itself, but it's very, very important that you don't reach out to the wrong journalists, right? Because each, uh, as Jim mentioned a moment ago, each journalist has a beat, which is a topic that, or theme that they, they focus on and they write about for a publication. So if you're a fintech app and you find a, you really need to find a journalist that writes about uh, financial technology, about that particular area. It can't just be a journalist that writes about tech, for example. 
they will have specific divisions within tech is a very big umbrella that they will focus on. And here, in, in a mistake that um, I've often seen is that if somebody has covered a similar product, like if you're searching for competitors, first of all, that's a really good technique. Um, search for your competitors and look for people that have covered your competitors or similar people, uh, similar companies in your space. Um, and, and then you can kind of bet that it's possible that they'll um, cover your company, right? Um, however, um, just because they wrote about a, a fintech app or a dating app two years ago does not necessarily mean they still cover that beat. Um, also, it depends on the context. It could be that a dating app received $20 million in funding. And you take a look um, at what the journalist usually writes, and he writes all about funding. So it could have potentially been um, any any funding announcement by any type of startup, right? So um, a good idea is, so is when you're searching for these, um, obviously search for competitors, um, search for your industry to see um, what, um, and, and this is simple Google search, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can, you know, PR companies have these um, fancy tools that make it a lot easier, but it can be done on Google. Um, so when you're, when you're Googling this, um, you want to make sure that, you know, they, they cover your industry, but then you also want to go in and you want to take a look. Um, oftentimes, if right in the article's byline, they'll have a link to the author page, and you can go and click on that link and you can see what they've published. And take a look at the headlines and, and read um, articles of the past um, couple of months and say, okay, these guys are still covering my industry. Absolutely. I think it's really important to look at that and make sure you, you, you can, you can uh, with, with Google, you can also look at like the most recent results within like six months, month, month, whatever it is, even within the last 24 hours, that might be a bit too specific. But you can um, you can refine your results in that way, which will really help you um, find the right uh, people. Uh, that said, when you have a look at what they've, they've um, written and you find a reason for, for pitching to them, when you write your pitch, you can obviously then personalize that pitch to, an, to a, a greater degree. So instead of just using the name, hi, hi Jim, I've got a great story for you, you can say, hey, I, I read your, your story about um, this financial app, and, and mine's similar, but it does this instead. I thought maybe this would be interesting to you as well. It shows that you take an interest in what they're writing, that you know that you're not just just uh, shot in the dark with your pitches, and um, I, I think that's a really key a tip, right, rather than a mistake, but it's, it's something that you can do. Um, because as, as Jim always says, there's, there's nothing worse than receiving an email from a, a journalist that, that says, this has got nothing to do with me, please remove me from your mailing list. Uh, it's embarrassing, and uh, yeah, so you, you need to avoid that. So you target your, your journalists as you would target your customers, really, you know? Um, um, yeah, Carlos, I hope that answered your question, and if um, you have any follow-up questions, please feel free. I uh, just want to let everybody know we have uh, one more point that we're going to go over. Um, and and then if you do have any questions, please um, throw them at us. We can be here as, as long as we need. Yeah, absolutely. I think the last point really is uh, not don't be complacent when you do get coverage. It's very easy to say, oh, I got, I got published in TechRunch or the New York Times or whatever, and just leave it at that. Really, you need to, to really make the most of that coverage, share it with your, your, your community, with your crowd, you need to tweet it, you need to put it on your website, um, the, the little badges uh, of the publication of your website, because that really builds your reputation as a founder or as a, as a company, um, and that's important. A couple of things you can do, um, you can put it on different Reddit channels, um, especially if you're a really niche industry, um, some of those Reddit channels can drastically increase the, um, the readership of the article. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, other sites like um, Growth Hackers, for example, if it's kind of a marketing focused um, announcement. Um, but also it's good to share internally. Um, make sure you're sharing that um, the coverage with your employees, with your investors or poten potential investors, you know, anybody that's on uh, an email list that you guys have, um, especially if it's a really uh, a really strong result, um, it, you need to make sure you maximize it as much as possible. Um, there's there's you know obviously Forbes and and the New York Times have a readership of millions of people and that's awesome, um, but at the same time um, you can drastically improve um, the shares, your engagement, or your reach, and everything. Yeah, yeah and. Like 
Yeah, and actually, yeah. I mean, it, it might not be. It might not be that it, uh, com you know, increases the the shares and everything, but it gets to the important people as well. You know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you want to keep your investors in the loop of of everything positive that has happened. So, um, you want to make sure you um, you share. As much as the, other, the other benefit of that as well is it's also extremely motivating. If you've been working for months and months, slaving away in the, in that office, in that garage, whatever it is with your, with your team, and you do get covered in a big public. It's like it, it, it sort of it, it underlines the work you've been doing. It's it's a motivator, right? So, yeah. and <coughs> excuse me, sorry. The um, the other thing is uh, the effect of press is cumulative. The more you share it, the more you're likely to hit other journalists who are interested in your product and, and potentially uh, cover you on that as well. So that's yeah. something we've seen. Um, All right. No, I think, um, well, the biggest mistake um, we learned today was our lesson was I'll call you before we start these to make sure we don't have the same shirt on. Yeah, nothing, nothing more embarrassing than wearing the same dress. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if anybody else has any questions, I'll pause for 15 seconds to go ahead and um, uh, see if anybody has any questions. Is there anything on Facebook? Any questions? All right, cool. Well, thank that was you. a great moment of silence. It was. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I just want to let you know, um, this will, uh, you'll be able to see this. We'll put this up on Publicize's YouTube page. So everybody that's registered and attended will be sending this out um, as well. Um, we'll be able to, ah, we got one. What's the best way to, to ladder, ladder up publicity? publicity. Uh, can you explain that question a little bit more, Alex? <coughs> Ah, from a smaller pub to a bigger one. Well, um, um, actually, we we had a uh, Forbes writer. Go ahead. Uh, we had a Forbes writer on uh, a last uh, or a couple webinars ago um, named Freddie Dawson, who had um, some uh, good perspective on this. And and we also have a um, we we had a webinar with Rebecca Grant, who's a former writer at VentureBeat, uh, who had a different perspective. So I can share both perspectives with you. Um, so uh, Alex's question is, you know, what's the best way um, to kind of uh, <laughs> escalate your, um, your publicity? If you start off on a smaller, more industry-focused blog, for example, and then you want to move up to a more general news site like the Wall Street Journal or a bigger tech blog like TechCrunch, for example. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, Freddie Dawson's answer is that uh, public, and he worked at Forbes, you know, um, his publication, um, or at least his his job um, as a writer, wasn't necessarily to be as um, uh, breaking news um, as much as as covering um, interesting companies that fell, fell within his beat. And he covers international startups and startups in London as well. Um, so oftentimes he would be searching these smaller tech blogs, and he would find. Um, uh, he would find uh, uh, companies, I'm sorry, that interested him, and he would reach out to them and, and write a story about them. Um, so I would say that um, industry level uh, publications are definitely important um, because it could be that you are, um, that, that a, a journalist who is researching that industry um, is, is following these publications. Um, uh, on another side of the spectrum, uh, we had a former venture beat writer, Rebecca Grant, um, and she had mentioned that um, at a number of these tech blogs, um, they really do like they, they publish multiple articles per day, um, and they often compete with other like venture beat in TechCrunch, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they are they often compete with other direct competitors and to break news. And so if uh, if there was a um, if there was a company that was already featured in like let's say the next web or TechCrunch, um, chances are that VentureBeat wouldn't have picked up that story. Now, obviously, if it's an an Apple release or something that's um, hugely impactful um, to a lot of people, everybody will cover it. But if it's a, a small startup launch, um, it, it could be that um, they decided not to cover that because. Um, because another tech blog already went with it. Um, my recommendation um, would would never to be ignore uh, to, never to ignore your industry um, smaller industry publications. Um, I often think it's uh, 
actually pretty beneficial in terms of like an ROI because um, it's it's great to be like yeah hey I got on uh, I got on TechCrunch but when I'm trying to sell some B two B marketing um, platform or, or service to the director of marketing at an enterprise level company. It could be that that person is not even reading TechCrunch, and it's better to reach out to like a marketing land mm -hmm. um, type publication that's within that industry, right? Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think one of the by, by focusing on a specific industry niche or, or an industry vertical, we like to say, is is you can the, the ROA can be more more direct. Um, it, we've had one client pick up three or four new customers just simply uh, by being featured in a in a, in a in a very, a, like a, a publication focused on engineers, right? Um, and that's that's something that's really, really, um, it, you don't necessarily see the benefits. I really just want to be on the big sites, but actually focusing on the industry is a, is a key way to, to talk directly to the people that are interested in what you do. Um, in, in terms, in terms um, Alex, of, of moving up, um, you know, I would, I would recommend that um, you, you can change the context um, when you're reaching out to uh, a larger publication, you're going to have to understand their readership and what's important to their readership. Um, so maybe your uh, maybe your product um, affects drastically um, one part of an industry or one industry, um, and so that would be huge news for the publication that covers that industry. But how do you make that story into something that impacts um, million? Um, Plus readers, and in, in the case of like TechCrunch, for example, it could be potential investors um, in Silicon Valley, right? So um, how, and then so the trick there would be kind of adapting a story um, to fit that audience, and you'd have to do um, a little bit of searching um, into what your own company does, and, and kind of a bigger um, picture. Uh, let's say, um, let's say you have a. Um, a cybersecurity, like a, an app, I'm trying to think off the top of my head here, forgive me, but like a, a, a security app. And this is right around the time where the um, FBI is trying to um, unlock the, the phone of the San Bernardino, um, um, iPhone of the San Bernardino, Bernardino killer, for example, right? So um, if it fits, within an overarching theme that's already going on in the media, um, there's definitely opportunities for you to put um, your company in there. Hey, my, my, my app would unlock an iPhone in two seconds. Yeah. Like that would be something that would be very huge. Um, or the opposite, it would, uh, <laughs> when you have a, a, an app and people worried about NSA security, and stuff, my app will actually protect your mm -hmm. phone from, from that sort of external intrusion. Um, which is, is the same. We we recently, obviously, Brexit was huge news, especially for me. You can probably tell by my accent. Um, yeah, uh, Brexit was huge news uh, in the UK, and we had a number of our clients that were able to uh, not necessarily speak about their product, but speak about how uh, that uh, exit from the potential exit from the EU will affect their companies. And we're able to be featured on some very big, um, big publications, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I don't remember the Telegraph or something. Yeah, something, something big. Um, so, so there are other ways that you can climb up that ladder, I guess, um, to put it in your terms, Alex, um, by finding out ways how you can fit into a broader audience, um, especially if your product is very niche. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question. If you have um, a follow-up for us, let me know. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, um, we've been on the air for 38 minutes. Uh, which is a new world record for us, mm -hmm. uh, but we're um, all right. <laughs> uh, but we're going no problem, Mauricio. Um, cybersecurity example is actually one of my favorite examples too. Um, I'm kind of a cybersecurity nerd, so I'll geek out on that. Um, all right, so I just want to say thanks um, for everybody for taking the time. Um, we all we have these these kind of um, inter office. Um, uh, webinars where we kind of just sit back, relax, share um, some lessons that we've learned. Um, but we also have webinars where we invite um, 
uh, editors and, and journalists as well, or other, like we've had, um, for example, Dylan Tweeney, who's the former editor in chief of Venture Beat. Uh, like I said, we had Freddie Dawson from Forbes, and we had a moderator from uh, Product Hunt, Nicole Elizabeth Demery, um, as, as some as well. examples. Yeah. yeah, and Rebecca Grant as, as well. So um, we will have those type of webinars as well, and it's really interesting to get the feedback um, right from a journalist's mouth. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, Please, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in touch um, about those. And, and thanks again for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for joining us on Facebook and in the webinar here. It's been a pleasure. Um, so, yeah, look forward to your feedback. All right, we'll do. Take care. Thank All you, right. guys. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye.